The views expressed in this podcast are solely those of the speaker and do not necessarily represent the opinions of the Consumer Healthcare Products Association. If you manufacture a consumer healthcare product, which a lot of our audience does, I'm also guessing you probably package it in plastic. But plastic is under a lot of scrutiny these days, especially by state lawmakers. Nobody wants more plastic in the environment, but laws are being passed in the states that require manufacturers to pay for the recycling programs. What will that mean for what consumers pay when they buy one of our products? And how can companies lean in right now to become more environmentally compliant and friendly? Lots to talk about in today's Chippa Chat. Welcome to Chippa Chat. Conversations in the consumer healthcare industry with Anita Brickman. Hello, everyone. Consumer healthcare products like dietary supplements, consumer medical devices, and over the counter medicines, they are some of the most highly regulated industries in America today. And if you think about it, they should be. FDA regulation is important. It provides consumers with peace of mind that these products they're using for minor ailments are safe and effective. Regulation of consumer healthcare products, though, is now entering a new territory. As global climate change becomes a greater focus of policymakers around the world, over the counter healthcare manufacturers are seeing more environmental regulation coming their way. In the United States, ground zero for new environmental regs have been in the states. Whether it's pharmaceutical drug take pack, sunscreen bans in Hawaii, or limits on plastic packaging, the American states are beginning to act quite aggressively on issues related to the environment. To talk with us about these very important issues, we have a great panel of experts who've been on the front lines of these state debates. Adam Peer is Senior Director for Packaging and Consumer markets with the American Chemistry Council, another trade association here in Washington, D.C., this one comprised of chemical companies, including manufacturers of plastic and plastic products. Andy Hackman also joins us as a principal lobbyist for Sirlin Haley, a government relations firm that does work for clients in multiple state capitals and city halls. Andy himself was at the forefront of groundbreaking legislation in Maine that created a first-of-its-kind extension producer responsibility law for paper and packaging waste. Andy, you're going to have to explain that to us. And of course, we have Carlos Gutierrez, Vice President of State and Local Government Affairs for CHPA and a frequent guest on Chippa Chats. He is our Chief State and Local Lobbyist and has vast experience in dealing with environmental regulation of consumer health care products. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Anita. Good to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Carlos, I'm going to make you my first victim, okay? Paint a picture for us, if you will. What exactly are states doing related to environment, and what does this mean for our industry? Well, you know, I can really only speak for about the last decade. I I started at CHPA in 2010, and pretty much right upon starting, we started hearing rumblings, particularly out west in, in California, from local governments, uh, county governments, expressing concern about pharmaceuticals in water. Now, you know, the topic of whether or not we need to be concerned about that is an entirely different podcast. But at the end of the day, there are pharmaceuticals in water. Um, They get there primarily because Americans take medicine. They don't always metabolize them entirely. We pass them through our bodies and they end up in the water. Now, EPA has spoken to this. FDA has spoken to this. They're in very small trace amounts. We're talking about parts per trillion, and they have no health impact on humans. The environmental community, however, was still concerned that they could have an impact on ecology. So they started making manufacturers pay for the disposal, the take back, if you will, of of pharmaceuticals. We started to see that in California, That has now extended to Oregon, Washington, New York, and most recently in Maine. Then fast forward to about 2015, and Hawaii started talking about banning sunscreen. And that is as ironic a statement as you can make, right? Sunscreen and Hawaii. But they had concern with their coral reef. And they were suggesting that their coral was bleaching as a result of sunscreen getting to the coral and damaging it. Now, 
So sunscreen in the water from people swimming at exactly. the beach. Exactly. Um, the okay. vast majority of scientists around the world have said it's a, it's a function of warming waters, global climate change. That's why uh, coral is having a rough time right now. Um, nonetheless, they went forward um, and banned two ingredients, octanoxate and oxybenzone. They're found very popular uh, ingredients in, in sunscreen. So as recently as the end of uh, last year, the county of Maui extended that sunscreen ban of octanoxate and oxybenzone to include all chemical sunscreens. And that's a big concern. Um, you know, the, the rates of melanoma in Hawaii are really high. And this, they're talking about banning about 85 to 90 percent of the sunscreens that are on the market today. Wow. So then fast forward to just the last two or three years, and it's extended beyond just ingredients in, in consumer healthcare products. And now they're focusing on the packaging that these products are uh, sold in. And so just, again, I'm sure we're going to speak um, uh, more about it later in this podcast, but also last year, the states of Maine and Oregon passed groundbreaking legislation, which essentially um, shifts the cost of recycling from local government to the manufacturers of, of, uh, of products in general. So that's the evolution, I'd say, over the last decade. It's not going anywhere. It's going to continue. I think so long as climate change is a point of discussion, states and localities are going to act, especially if the federal government you know, kind of continues to be a little slow to respond to that issue. This can't be an easy side to be on for you, Carlos. I mean, we're talking about coral reefs, the environment, keeping pharmaceuticals out of the water. What has this meant as far as the time and effort it takes to kind of paint an accurate picture of the true health impact of some of these evolving trends? You know, it, it takes a lot of education because it, it's a very complex issue. It's very easy to say, you know, I want to be on the side of coral. Everybody wants to be on the side of coral, right? No one wants to damage it. But at the end of the day, you do have to rely on science. And um, the science really has been on the manufacturer's side. Unfortunately, the politics has been more on the environmental side. And so slowly but surely, they have been able to pass legislation, which we think is going to have an adverse impact on consumers and on the cost of consumer health care otherwise affordable consumer health care. But it's just an ongoing process. We have to be out there. We have to continue to educate um, lawmakers and the public as to um, really what's at stake. And there is an appropriate way to do environmental policy. Andy, Carlos mentioned legislation. And in the intro, we mentioned your work in Maine and the passage of legislation there. What is that law designed to do? Yeah, and, and there were definitely two different visions on how to address this issue about having manufacturers involved in funding for recycling of, of packaging. Um, the whole goal is to, to, in essence, truly make manufacturers in some regards, either financially or also operationally responsible for recycling packaging or their entire product at the end of its life cycle. It started in areas where there were hard to manage materials like tires uh, household hazardous waste, mattresses and carpet were sort of the forerunners in this where there was an actual concern about the product as it entered the end of its life cycle. This is really the first time we've seen in the United States an effort by government and stakeholders to, to have manufacturers responsible financially for for paying for the recycling of, of, of packaging. And so it's it was certainly an intense debate in Maine. Uh, we offered two different perspectives on on where we thought uh, there could be an effective reform to the recycling system in Maine. Largely, um, it's a system that represents the status quo and, and the law that passed, unfortunately. Uh, a number of industry players, including some that, that, that participate in CHPA's members, um, we're involved in trying to, to reframe that debate because um, as it stands now, the law in Maine will, will truly just fund existing activities and fund municipalities for what they're doing right now. And, and we had hoped for a, a law that would function in a way that would change the system and, and bring more materials into the recycling system. But at the end of the day, the legislature um, chose to really kind of put a Band-Aid on, on the current situation. So it's a uh, going to be a continuing uh, evolution as the law is implemented. But the, the vision 
as the legislature passed uh, the bill is that manufacturers essentially are, are going to be taxed um, and that funding will flow to a third party organization and the funding will then be um, formulatically dispersed out to municipalities. So Andy, you know, but if I'm the average voter living in Maine or elsewhere, and I hear you say, okay, big business is going to have to have extended responsibility for the packaging they produced in the first place and shoulder that cost. Um, I may not think that's a bad idea that business should pay for that, but you said they are being taxed. What does that mean for how much the product costs? How's that all going to work? Yeah, I mean, it's the the dynamic where the consumer believes that this is a, a good thing to do. And, and that was echoed in the legislature. The legislature said we need to have these out-of-state companies pay for the cost of disposing and recycling their, their wasteful packaging. That was certainly the mantra. Uh, but it really doesn't get to the heart of, of how a system operates for recycling. And it doesn't get to the fact that that cost inputs are going to be passed along to the consumer. That's that's how you know capitalism works. It's how the pricing of, of goods work. As we are seeing the effects of inflation right now and supply chain issues impacting consumer goods, you know, I think 6.2% was quoted last year. And it's definitely something that will be factored into the cost of those goods. And I think as a consumer or a taxpayer in a particular state that moves forward with these policies, we want to ensure that the system is getting better as a result of more funding going into that. And the, the, the taxpayer is not going to see, in Maine in particular, recycling is funded via property tax. Municipalities collect property tax from citizens and then use that for, obviously, different government services. In this case, recycling is one of those services. There's not going to be a single dollar return to consumers in Maine as a result of, of this law passing, yet there is going to be millions of additional dollars put into the recycling system. So as a taxpayer that's still vested in the system of recycling and not seeing my costs go down, I would want to see the recycling system necessarily and mandated to improve as a result of, of this law passing. And what's most likely to happen is the funding will come in from manufacturers, the price of goods will go up to reflect the cost of, of that program being implemented in Maine, and the municipalities will use that money to fund existing recycling operations and, and then shift funding into other programs. And, and the transparency is not going to be there in terms of, of delivering on a better recycling system that consumers will see necessarily in the state of Maine. We certainly think there are ways to have a system or extended producer responsibility work in a way that does that. Um, but the way the law is crafted right now in Maine, that's, we don't expect that to happen. And Anita, that's an important point, by the way. Um, you know, for an industry like ours, consumer health care, where the average cost of a, of a medicine or a, a dietary supplement, what have you, is around $8 and change. So I don't know what this new program is going to cost, but I, like, like Andy suggested, it's going to be passed on to the consumer. And so what used to be $8 and change may now be $10 and change. And that may not seem like a big deal. But for people on the margins, it's a really big deal. And whether or not they are going to go and seek treatment for a common ailment, which could then turn into an infection, which then requires you to go to the doctor or go to the emergency room, um, it could become really problematic, at least in healthcare. So we try to convey that to lawmakers. They may not sound like a lot. We, we really don't know how much that's going to be, but it will have a pretty profound impact. On people's lives, um, particularly those that are, are, you know, for common ailments, um, the role that consumer healthcare products play. Absolutely. And it is a big deal, Carlos. Adam, we haven't heard from you yet. Why this kind of laser focus on plastic? Is it dangerous? Is it that all kinds of plastic can't easily be recycled? I don't know much about it. Well, I think you've illustrated a uh, common misperception. Plastics is a sustainable material and plays an important role in our society. It produces less greenhouse gas than alternatives because it's lighter to transport, and it requires much less material to perform the same function, which is an important benefit. Plastics should never be in the environment. I think we can all agree on that. And proposals to ban or restrict 
uh, plastics may be well-intended, but they're very misguided. The alternatives have a greater environmental impact than plastics. And when states and local governments produce bans and restrictions, it only sets us back. Instead, we should really be focusing on creating a more circular economy by finding ways to increase recycling and bolster end markets for plastics and all materials. All right. So what you've said, plastic is a good packaging material, and it's critical in the way consumer healthcare products are packaged. In fact, the FDA mandates certain types of packaging for over-the-counter medicines to ensure that they're safe, the quality is there, they're stable. And on top of that, we've got the Consumer Product Safety Commission weighing in. So these kind of changes in the way they package their products could be really tough for our manufacturers, but are there new technologies on the horizon that could help them do that, right? To still meet these rules and regulations, but reduce that environmental footprint, so to speak, uh, that legislators are so worried about. Yeah, absolutely. And again, plastic is a sustainable material. I don't think anybody wants to go back to uh, glass IV bottles. And, you know, again, compared to the alternatives, you know, many times plastic is two and a half times lighter to transport, which leads to just less greenhouse gas emissions. And the exciting thing is that advanced recycling is going to make plastics even more sustainable. In fact, there's seven and a half billion dollars worth of investments in advanced recycling. Advanced recycling will allow us to bring greater volumes and types of plastics into greater circularity. And that's why ACC is calling on Congress to require that plastic packaging contain 30% recycled plastics by 2030. And in fact, more than 400 brands have announced that they want more recycled material in their packaging. So the demand is definitely there and advanced recycling is critical for helping all of us to meet those demands. And how do they do that? How do you change the makeup of the plastic in your products? Is that a long-term process? Is it costly? Well, one of the important things it's going to be is working with the value chain to look for more opportunities to incorporate recycled plastics into packaging. And that's the best way that we can help reduce um, plastics environmental footprint is by finding ways to bring it back into circularity. So the exciting thing about advanced recycling is that the uh, the feedstock uh, is more virgin-like, which allows you to put it into a greater amount of packaging products. Okay, when you say virgin, you like you mean more like the original. So is it? It's safe. It's not contaminated, right? Yep. And I should clarify: the output of advanced recycling is virgin-like, which allows you to put it into more uh, packaging products. Got it. Got it. Okay. So, and you said there is a demand for this. There is. Over 400 brands have announced that they want more recycled content in their packaging. And advanced recycling is one of the ways that we can help uh, those brands meet their obligations. All right. So it sounds like industry is getting on board. But Andy, you've got states out there like Maine and Oregon that are already shifting the costs of recycling and disposal to the private sector. I'm going to ask you to pull out your crystal ball do you have it ready? Do you have your crystal ball? <laughs> just yeah, kidding. All right. Is this just the beginning? Do you polish it weekly? Well, I, you know, any good lobbyist does, as I know Carlos has several in his office. All right. Do you expect other states to follow suit in this trend of shifting the cost and responsibility? Yeah, I, I definitely think that there's going to be an reduction of probably another dozen or so bills um, in 2022 here. I, I would predict there's a, a high likelihood that one or two will potentially move forward this year. The real question is, um, will be the continued intersection with inflation. I think there's a sensitivity to that now that will impact this issue in ways that it did not last year when we were debating it. Um, but I do think the issue- So you mean, has, Andy, now that things are already costing so much more, mm -hmm. people are going to say, wait a minute- just adding that couple extra dollars on top of what more I'm paying, they, that may shift some of the debate. I think it may shift some of the debate. And, and I think even if we had had the significant inflationary factors in front of the public 
in April or May of 2021, we may have seen more change to, to the laws in Oregon and in Maine particularly. Um, but I don't think it's a guarantee that this issue is going to go away. The re recycling system continues to be challenged in finding markets for certain materials. And there continues to be the um, perception, at least in the public, that there needs to be something done about this. And the perception that, that our, our recycled materials go overseas, whether or not that's completely true anymore or not, um, but the, the perceived problems and flaws in the recycling system, there's, there's definitely a belief that that needs to be fixed, and that's galvanizing policymakers. So I think there will be uh, perhaps some additional consideration given as, as these laws are considered in, in this, this coming year. Uh, but I think that, you know, the, the overall trend is that we're likely to see a couple of more states adopt um, packaging EPR bills uh, in 2022. And there continues to be interest at the federal level as well in this area of policy, whether or not we'll get to a, a federal uh, legislative package on this issue. And, you know, typically, as you see issues bubble up in the states, there begins to, to become some norms that are set in, in different states and occasionally that results in federal legislation. I won't predict yet if that's gonna happen here, uh, but I definitely think the, the dialogue is growing not just at the state level, but also at the federal level. Carlos, you mentioned drug take back sunscreens, kind of where all of this started before it shifted to packaging. Going back to those issues, what do you expect this year in 2022? Well, um, you know, there's currently five drug take back statewide laws in place in Oregon, California, New York, uh, Maine, and Washington. Uh, we've had uh, the states of Rhode Island, Massachusetts, uh, Hawaii, and Illinois all consider it as well. And I expect them to continue in 2022 to at the very least file a bill, debate it, and then just sort of depending on the priorities of the legislature, whether or not they get passed. Um, in terms of sunscreen, you know, fortunately, it's only been Hawaii that has really acted on this. Um, Key West acted on it in the past, but uh, the state determined that they didn't have the authority to do that in Florida. So um, I don't expect that to move beyond what is happening in Hawaii. Now, what what Maui passed in 2021 and late 2021 about this expansion of the ban to include all chemical sunscreens, that could very well uh, move on to, you know, the big island and some of the other islands in Hawaii. But I don't, I don't anticipate that that's going to move beyond the state of Hawaii. Can tourists still bring it with them? You know, that's a good question. The, the way the statewide bill is written, um, it is only a ban on the sale. But the way that Maui uh, wrote their ordinance late last year was to include use um, as well. So I don't know how they're going to enforce that. I don't know that, uh, you know, how you enforce that even, you know, if people are bringing it in from the mainland. But um, I, I think it's, just, you know, it's going to be it's sort of a poorly written ordinance. Um, I don't think it'll be enforced. Um, and they've even we've heard testimony to that effect. And I think they view it as more, look, we just want it in writing. It'll change behavior over time. And so we'll see how it nets out. All right. So all three of you, as we get ready to close out this podcast, some final thoughts. You all either advise your trade association, your member companies. If right now you were saying to a company about the importance, the um, the imminent risk involved with this environmental movement in the States. What I, advice would you offer to private companies? How big of a deal is this, number one? And number two, what should they be doing in their own manufacturing processes to get ready for this? Uh, Andy, can we start with you? Sure. I, you know, I think these issues are here to stay, and the, the depth and breadth of state legislatures engaging in, in these issues is um, certainly going to continue to be a, a forefront on, on the sustainability movement across the board impacting uh, companies. And I think there has been a continued shift in some legislatures, for better or for worse, uh, into different sort of sectors in terms of political interest in these issues. And I think just given the the, the uh, dichotomy of views that we've got right now, companies are going to have to prepare uh, for potential compliance in a number of different jurisdictions. 
And I think, you know, in terms of best practices for companies, one communication uh, within your supply chains is, is going to continue to be critical and, and helping manage your own destiny with a vision on what the future is going to look like and, and how you're going to achieve goals and compliance um, in some of the states that have programs that will, will have a, a definite regulatory hook. Uh, and really understanding your, your product supply chain in the packaging sector in particular, and the ability to, to meet some of the obligations in these different states. Adam, your thoughts? Well, I would encourage everybody in the value chain to keep leaning in. Uh, some of the policies that we're promoting uh, to support that are things like the 30% percent by 2030 national recycled plastic standard. And we're also encouraging states and the federal government to modernize uh, the recycling regulatory system to develop a more circular economy. These are things like supporting advanced recycling legislation. We also need national recycling standards for plastics so that we're all playing from a level playing field and we're using common terms and um, denominations. And we also need to continue studying the impact of greenhouse gas emissions from all materials to make sure that we're uh, pursuing evidence-based policy. And so these are just some of the things that you know we're asking policymakers to support the value chain as uh, as they lean into using more recycled content to bring us closer to a circular economy. And Carlos, last question for you. If our companies lean in, if we have a story to tell that industry is leaning in and trying to do the right thing, even while making sure they're meeting all of the regulatory requirements of the packaging around the medicine, does that make your job easier? Well, I mean, it's, it's always great to have a story to tell. And as we go around the country and educate lawmakers on the complexities of packaging, particularly for consumer health care products, that, you know, even if we wanted to change our packaging tomorrow, we couldn't necessarily do it. Uh, we would have to get it tested. You had right. mentioned the Consumer Product Safety Commission earlier. So um, even if we wanted to change it, we can't just do it overnight. So as they craft legislation, um, lawmakers, uh, you know, please be aware of that, that things can't happen overnight for a variety of reasons beyond just environment. You can't really look at this strictly as an environmental law that you're passing, but also safety of, of medicines and efficacy of those consumer healthcare products. So it's very complex. We just got to be out there educating lawmakers. And, you know, Andy can speak to this, can be a pretty tough, daunting thing to do when there's so much turnover in states, but it just requires being on an airplane, getting out and, um, and really always being at the table. You know, ignore the days of ignoring this as an issue are over. They're here. And so for companies, you know, I would encourage having some sort of sustainability program in place. And, um, like, like the other panelists said, you know, really lean into this and, um, you know, because I don't think it's not only lawmakers that are expecting this, but um, I think surveys have showed even consumers are now expecting this. So uh, in the end, it's, it even becomes sort of a marketing uh, tool for manufacturers. I was I was going to say you see it in marketing more and more. I received something in the mail the other day where it was like same product, less packaging. That was part of the sell that you're getting what you always did, but with less of a footprint. So, wow, very insightful conversation. And I want to thank all three of you for joining me. Clearly, we all want what's best for the environment. There's no doubt about that. And we all believe climate change is real and needs to be addressed. It is critical, however, though, that policymakers understand the consequences of these types of laws and that they will undoubtedly have an impact on not only what the consumer pays, but there is a potential impact on the safety and effectiveness of products as well. Yeah. A truly complex issue. We all want to address the environment's degradation. We have to, but we need to do so in a carefully thought out manner that doesn't compromise the integrity of medicine, dietary supplements, and medical devices so many millions of people and families rely on. That is another edition of Chip a Chat. For Carlos, Andy, and Adam, I'm Anita Brickman. See you next time. Thank you for joining us here at Chip a Chat. For more information and to hear our entire catalog of shows, please visit chpa.org.